happening tonight in Vancouver. When I got there, I was shocked at the situation in the ER. They were overrun. BC hospitals are overwhelmed with unvaccinated COVID patients, forcing those who are in need of urgent care to wait hours in the ER. A horrific attack near Kabul's airport. Dozens killed, including Afghans and Americans. Just hours after Canada ended its airlift. We wish we could have stayed longer. What about those left stranded? And how will the U.S. They respond? The removal of voting places at universities and colleges for the federal election. We didn't know when there was going to be an election. The backlash Elections Canada is receiving for the decision. This is City News Everywhere. Good evening, UBC, SFU, UVic, and Thompson Rivers University are all announcing COVID vaccination guidelines today for those attending classes in September. Now, you'll need to either be vaccinated against COVID-19 or you'll have to undergo a rapid test. A UBC spokesperson saying late today that all staff and students will need to get tested on campus unless they are fully vaccinated. This measure is in addition to the already announced public health order that requires proof of vaccination for those living in student housing. They had no beds full of COVID patients, people in the hallways on stretchers, um, and I sat there for almost three hours. You better hope you don't need immediate medical attention anytime soon. That's the message from a BC woman who went to the ER for her heart condition this week. She was horrified by the number of unvaccinated COVID patients in the hospital and says she waited hours to be seen for her serious medical condition. It's a little unnerving. It's a little frightening and and I was going to leave and they explained to me what kind of risk that put me in of having a stroke and um, I wondered how many other people went in and left. Wendy Lutz was diagnosed with atrial fibrillation five years ago, which is an irregular heartbeat that can lead to blood clots, stroke, and even heart failure. She had an episode Tuesday afternoon and was in immediate need of a cardioversion, which is when electricity is used to help an abnormally fast heart rate go back to a normal rhythm. She couldn't believe the dire situation she encountered when she entered Vernon Jubilee Hospital. A steady stream of young people and even a toddler coming in with COVID and seriously ill, unable to get air, unable to speak, and they were all unvaccinated. That was the one question that you could hear through the room. Have you had a vaccination? No. Three hours after Lutz arrived, she received treatment, but says only half the staff that normally assist with cardioversions were available. She was told this was the most healthcare workers they could currently provide, and they would have to do all they could despite being short staffed. This is why our choices to be vaccinated or not vaccinated actually have much larger implications than our own individual health. What we're seeing is that because there are just so many unvaccinated people getting COVID right now, that adds pressure to the hospital system. A friend of mine who's a cancer specialist re reminded me of this the other day. Elective doesn't mean that it's not important. So, there, so he has patients who, who are cancer patients that are waiting for really important surgery that have had their surgery canceled because the hospital is just is being impacted so much by by this wave and that and that to me is is really really sad lutz feels like unless people see firsthand what's happening in bc's hospitals they can't fully understand how dire the situation is i felt nothing but empathy for working in that kind of environment day after day with no end in sight when there's a solution and people just have to get the vaccine in new westminster ashley burr city news COVID-19 case numbers are up again in B.C. Public health officers are reporting 724 new cases of the virus in the past 24 hours, along with two more deaths. Now, of the active cases, 149 are in the hospital, 83 of whom are in the ICU. Over the last two weeks, people not fully vaccinated accounted for 82% of total cases and 86% of hospitalizations. More than 83% of eligible British Columbians over the age of 12 have received their first dose of a COVID-19 vaccine, and more than 75% have both doses.
explosions near Kabul's airport erupting Thursday during the final stretch of a massive and chaotic evacuation from Afghanistan. A warning, images from the scene are disturbing, showing some of those hurt and bleeding in what the Pentagon describes as a complex attack. Two suicide bombers assessed to have been ISIS fighters detonated in the vicinity of the Abbey Gate at Hamad Karzai International Airport and in the vicinity of the Barron Hotel, which is immediately adjacent. U.S. service members among those killed. American officials believe ISIS-K, an Afghan affiliate of ISIS, and a sworn enemy of the Taliban, is responsible for the attack that follows warnings of severe, credible, and imminent security threats outside the airport. That's where thousands have been gathering, hoping for a way out. Canadian Armed Forces, aware of the explosion, saying we can confirm that all CAF members are safe and accounted for. Just hours after Canada ended its airlift mission. We stayed in Afghanistan for as long as we could. In an update Thursday, Canadian officials saying roughly 3,700 people were evacuated by Canada during its operation. But it's unclear how many Canadians and others who applied to come to the country remain stranded. We wish we could have stayed longer and rescued everyone who was so desperate to leave. That we could not is truly heartbreaking. Several European nations also wrapping up their evacuation efforts ahead of the U.S. troop withdrawal deadline early next week after the Taliban seized control of Afghanistan. With some five days until the American exit, the U.S. military says their airlifts will continue. Let me be clear, while we're saddened by the loss of life, both U.S. and Afghan, we're continuing to execute the mission. Our mission is to evacuate U.S. citizens, third country nationals, special immigrant visa holders, U.S. Embassy staff, and Afghans at risk. And that same U.S. military official also saying if they find who was behind the attack, they will go after them. As for those who've been left behind in Afghanistan, an official with Global Affairs Canada sharing a message for Canadians and Afghans who've helped with Canada's efforts on the ground. The message is find a safe place, stay there and stay in contact with Canadian government officials who, along with other allies from other countries, are still vowing to help get people out. It's not exactly clear how that's going to happen. Melissa Duggan, City News. Well, U.S. President Joe Biden spoke this afternoon at the White House threatening those behind the attack. To those who carried out this attack, as well as anyone who wishes America harm, know this. We will not forgive. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. I will defend our interests and our people with every measure at my command. It was a failure. It's a travesty. It is a national shame. Federal leaders furious Canada has left people behind in Afghanistan, but Justin Trudeau insists our involvement isn't over. Our engagement with Afghanistan is not done. Well, Mounties and Squamish say a two-car collision along the Sea to Sky Highway is a fatal one. Investigators haven't confirmed how many people are involved or the number of people killed. And the crash happened not far from Shannon Falls Provincial Park earlier this evening and in the northbound lanes. There are still some major delays for the area, with northbound traffic being detoured around the scene in one of the southbound lanes. Our CMP says investigators will be on the scene for at least a few more hours. Well, homicide detectives are in Agassiz tonight as they look into the death of a 25-year-old man. The man's body was found around 7.30 this morning in a field along Choat Road, and the integrated homicide investigation team will only say at this point the death is suspicious. While the case is not believed to be tied to the Lower Mainland gang conflict, there are said to be ties to the Seabird Island Indigenous community. And that community is asking for privacy to, quote, allow families to grieve through this difficult time. Anyone with information is being asked to contact IHIT. 
Well, it's still not clear what caused a structural collapse at a construction site in North Vancouver. It happened yesterday morning during a demolition at the old Empire Theatres building on Esplanade, killing one person and hurting another. The former theatre is currently undergoing extensive renovations. It took several hours to recover the body of the deceased person because of structural safety concerns. An investigation is currently underway to determine the cause of the collapse. Let's get an update now on the current wildfire situation in the province. We currently have 242 active fires with 11 new ones in the last two days, but all are relatively small. Parts of the Caribou and South Okanagan regions are still under some evacuation alerts and orders. A controlled ignition action at the White Rock Lake Fire was postponed because of wind conditions. Overall officials say cooler temperatures have been helpful in the firefight and are optimistic that next week more evacuees will be able to return home. We've already seen the numbers of alerts and orders drop significantly in the last seven days uh, to the point where we're, uh, it, folks are being allowed back in. Uh, some of the bigger fires like White Rock Lake, we still have some concerns, uh, like I spoke up earlier, that we don't want to uh, have people go back too early and uh, make sure everything is, is taken care of from a safety perspective, as well as the, uh, you know, the fire environment perspective. So I think we are trending in the right direction. We will continue to see those alerts and orders uh, reduced over time. There are currently more than 1,300 evacuated properties in the affected areas. They should have seen this coming. We didn't know when there was going to be an election. Elections Canada is getting backlash for cancelling a program to allow students to cast ballots on campus. And university groups are pushing the agency to reinstate it before the September 20th vote. While it blames the pandemic and a minority government that called a snap election, student groups don't buy it. When the pandemic hit, all of the attention had to go to planning uh, a general election and that could possibly be called within a pandemic situation. So there was a great deal of attention put on that. Elections Canada getting slammed online, including from this Simon Fraser University student who says as a first time voter in 2019, it took her over two hours to bust her riding from where she lived on campus in Burnaby. Last year, we had a provincial snap election in BC. Uh, Elections BC provided uh, post-secondary institutions with, uh, with special balloting on campus. Uh, I voted uh, on a special ballot um, and, uh, and you know, I, I voted in my home riding. Uh, and so I don't think that there is, you know, an excuse. With the Vote on Campus program, students could cast ballots for their home riding. It was introduced in 2015 and expanded to over 100 post-secondary institutions by 2019. Elections Canada announced it was cancelling the program last fall. This is another barrier. Uh, from them to voting. So I think if we want to increase voter turnout for young people who under 30 are the largest eligible voting block in the election, uh, we should be pro providing accessible voting locations. The BC Federation of Students says Elections Canada had already made up its mind about pulling the program before the election was called. But the agency says it couldn't coordinate with schools while staff and student groups left campus as part of public health orders. If you have ID that um, proves your residency in another place, you can go into any returning office in Canada during the whole period of the election up until September 14th, and you can cast your vote. So that's a good option for students. Well, at UBC, uh, the nearest Elections Canada office is a 30-minute bus ride away. In Vancouver, Crystal Adaris, City News. Watching explosions, watching death and destruction in Afghanistan is heartbreaking. Um, women and girls will once again be subjected to a brutal Taliban regime. There's no rule of law, no respect for rights. It's a travesty. Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole cautious as he condemns Canada's pullout from Afghanistan. But the Tory leader refused to explain what he would have done differently or how he'd handle the situation as prime minister. That's why Voters for six months, that window to act, know what your plan would be. that window to act for six months was missed by Mr. Trudeau. I wrote him a month ago to act. 
We've been asking for several years to try and get people that were at risk because of their help for Canada. And as Prime Minister, I will act. Aaron O'Toole's campaign has highlighted his experience as a member of the Canadian Armed Forces, but he refused to answer if he would have asked Canadian forces to stay beyond the American withdrawal deadline or asked Canadian soldiers to go outside Kabul airport to rescue stranded Afghanis and Canadians. This is a very difficult day, not just for Afghans, uh, but for people around the world, including in Canada, who have long been deeply committed to the Afghan people and a better future for Afghanistan. If the Conservative leaders' remarks were disappointing, the Liberal Party leaders were even more so. Speaking in Quebec City, Justin Trudeau refused to acknowledge that the Canadian government or politicians held any responsibility for people left behind. People that include not just Afghani citizens who worked for coalition forces, but Canadian citizens and permanent residents. We will continue to work with partners, with allies, with uh, regional uh, partners to make sure we're continuing to do everything we can. It, it was a failure. Uh, it's coming out more and more with veterans who've said they've raised concerns that the, the evacuation process should have happened earlier. They made lots of um, they've raised the concerns and said that this should have started earlier, that there should have been an easier process. The NDP's Jagmeet Singh highlighted the work Canadian Forces veterans have done to bring attention to this issue, but couldn't explain why his party didn't support those actions through legislative work. Green Party leader Annemi Paul is calling on all federal parties to suspend their campaigns for 24 hours to rescue those left behind. I think that it is very important that we make no mistakes Mistake, that this was foreseeable, this was avoidable, and it is a national shame that we have ended our evacuations knowing that we have left thousands and thousands of people behind that could have been rescued, that could have been evacuated if we had responded in a timely way. In Ottawa, Shaoli Lee, City News. Well, Vancouver police are searching for the owner of $12,000 in dental gold. The fillings, caps and bridges were recovered in June after VPD property crime investigators learned it had been sold to a gold buyer in East Vancouver. Dental gold is scrap gold that is removed from people's mouths by dentists. VPD investigators believe the seized gold may have been taken during a break and enter to a dental office or to the home of someone who had been collecting dental gold. This is uh, a very uh, strange and puzzling case. It's unlike anything I've ever uh, seen or heard about here. And uh, it's not something we come across uh, on a regular basis. We don't know where this gold was taken from, but we do believe it was likely obtained through crime. Anyone with information is asked to contact VPD or Crime Stoppers. Well, a Vancouver police dog was bitten by a suspect during an arrest this morning. Officers were responding to a man making threats at a downtown east side social housing complex. The suspect fled but was tracked by the help of canine officer Mando. The man was allegedly resisting arrest when he bit the dog who responded by biting back. The suspect was taken to hospital for treatment and police are recommending several charges. As for Mando the dog, Mando suffered minor injuries. Washington state officials have destroyed the first Asian giant hornet nest of the season. It was located near the town of Blaine, so that's just south of the border. The invasive species nest was found at the base of a dead alder tree about two miles from a nest eradicated last October. Asian giant hornets are often called murder hornets because they prey on native bee and wasp populations, consuming honeybee hives and posing a real threat to agriculture. The Vancouver Triathlon usually takes over Stanley Park for the running portion of the race, but not this year because of aggressive coyotes. Yes, there have been close to 40 attacks involving coyotes in the park just in the past few months. The organizers of the race, which is now in its 19th year, say they're looking for an alternate route or considering holding just the bike and the swim portions of the race. The event is scheduled for Monday, September 6th. 
All right, let's go live to one of our cameras here. This live shot looks just west of Burnaby Heights, and you can see there's a bright glow, and a couple of callers into our sister station, News 1130, have been saying that they can see a lot of smoke. Now, there is a post on social media saying this looks like the area near the Parkland refinery, but officials have not confirmed anything at this time. But once we do get any details, we will bring them to you as they become available.